Hello Indoraptor Pack! Welcome back to my channel and today we will be reacting to SCP-1507 Pink Flamingos. Does not sound very threatening if you ask me, but... You know, a lot of SCPs are not meant to be threatening. I mean, you got the old man, who's a complete psycho. And you also got 096, just to name a couple. But then you also have peaceful ones. Like 999, the Tickle Monster, or the iPods. So, we shall see how dangerous said flamingos are. And without further ado, let's get right down into it. Why would someone want to bring a large, aggressive dog into their house to protect their belongings? Keeping such a pet could prove very troublesome and costly. Where better to put plastic flamingos but in puddles on the front lawn? I'm not being ironic now. Of course, there are historical precedents for keeping aggressive pets, but some owners find that events can quickly turn tragic. In the city of St. Augustine, Florida, in September 1991, someone by the name of Alan Scott purchased a set of 15 decorative plastic flamingos and put them in a puddle on his front lawn. They were manufactured in another city in Florida, in Coral Springs. That's the owner of these lawn decorations didn't Florida. suspect anything was amok. And if the SCP Foundation hadn't intercepted his call to 911 on that fateful day, there would have been even more casualties. Fortunately, the Foundation sometimes wiretaps calls to the emergency services. If the events that provoke the call are suspicious enough, then the Foundation sends its capture teams to the site of the incident in question. Otherwise, the Foundation declines to interfere and leaves the affair to be dealt with by the ordinary rescue services. On September 18th, 1991, the Foundation intercepted just such a suspicious call. The victim claimed that he had been attacked by lawn flamingos. The 911 services don't react to such calls, assuming them to be the ravings of a lunatic or merely stupid jokes. However, in any ridiculous situation, the Foundation assumes the presence of anomalies and, as a rule, their right to do so. So a capture team was sent to the site of the incident. Dogecoin has uh, had ads. an unreal last 12 Always months. Ads. Elon Musk, Mark Cuban, Snoop. Once there, they found the body of Alan Scott surrounded by 15 plastic flamingos. Now they're housed in Wilderness Observation Cell 1-B. Okay, then. And now I'd like to find answers to the most disturbing questions about these flamingos together with you. How did these lawn birds come to life? Did they do so by chance or according to someone else's will? And most importantly, why are they so hostile to people? After taking these creatures into the Foundation's custody, it became obvious that it was they who had carried out the attack on Alan Scott. But this turned out to be an isolated incident. For 20 years, they bided their time, displaying no hostility towards people and behaving quite nicely. Until April 12, 2011, when there was a bit of a misunderstanding. A researcher named Boyd was playing around with the plastic flamingos, but when one of the individuals attempted to take food from Boyd's hand, the employee kicked the bird. As a result, the bird- Why? Why? You torture 682 enough, and now you're just kicking birds. Bird People down. ain't right. It's plastic noticeably damaged. After this incident, the flamingos began behaving aggressively toward all Foundation personnel. When their aggressive behavior began, the objects were reclassified from safe to Euclidean, meaning it's only possible to visit the objects while wearing protective garb and accompanied by two armed guards. A month after the Boyd incident, another incident occurred. On May 6, 2011, the lawn flamingos began to make a noise that was unlike any previously recorded sounds. Forty-five hours later, another 11 individuals were found in the wilderness observation cell. Now, there were 26 pink flamingos present in the cell. It's possible that their unusual sounds attracted other nearby anomalous flamingos. Or perhaps the noises they made were some kind of special singing that accompanies their reproduction, a theory to which I'm inclined. But why hadn't they reproduced in the two decades prior? Do they really have such a long gap between mating periods? Personally, I believe they only reproduce when faced with a threat. These flamingos, though they behave like birds, have plastic properties. So if you store these flamingos in favorable conditions, they can live practically forever. But if you damage the plastic they're made of, they'll die. And any remaining flamingos will reproduce. This reproduction also happens when a flamingo is not killed, but rather wounded, as in the case of Boyd's incident. It's likely that Alan Scott also paid a high price for acting rudely toward one of the birds. 
I found confirmation of this when I investigated Scott's house. It's odd that the foundation didn't cover it first. In the gap between the parquet and the wall, I found a receipt for the purchase of seven lawn flamingos. It's possible that Scott kicked one of the birds either intentionally or purely by chance, initiating their reproductive process and instigating their aggressive behavior. These anomalous plastic flamingos have an impressive arsenal with which to attack their victims. Whereas live birds have only their beaks and talons, their plastic relatives have metal struts with which they're affixed to the ground. It's with these body parts that the flamingos inflict laceration and puncture wounds on the face, especially targeting the eyes. They neglect to use their beaks because of their lack of functionality. Their beaks suffice for playing or for eating food, though they seem to have no special need for the latter. I traveled to a small factory in Coral Springs where these lawn decorations are made in order to find out more about the revitalization of the garden decoration industry. It turned out that the factory was producing a wide variety of decorative animals, but according to the employees, no flamingos had been produced there since October 1991. I posed as a buyer looking for the birds, but a manager was clearly unsettled when he heard I was looking for flamingos. His good-natured smile disappeared. He muttered something about sanitary epidemiological service and then said they were closed for business that day and that I had to go. I left the factory but began to surveil the manager. Immediately after I left, he made a call and several uniformed personnel arrived. They were most likely SCP Foundation personnel. For my own safety, I left the city that very day. That manager probably knows the full story about the lawn flamingos, including how they came to light. This is a local tale about a child who brings free of mother's grasp. The Foundation itself speculates that the reason lies in the animator, or SCP-243. This object is a collection of several small alkaline batteries grouped together in a small ellipse about 10 centimeters in diameter, with the battery's negative poles facing inwards. Inanimate objects within SCP-243's area of effect begin to levitate or move, displaying unusual flexibility and plasticity. They also show signs of elementary animalistic instincts, including herd behavior and the instinct for self-preservation. The subjects can exist as a flock or can gather together and become one larger object. For example, a group of umbrellas tested during the experiments became a single structure and began behaving as a single organism. Additionally, each object behaves according to its purpose. Yeah. Knives look for something to cut, while chairs look for a person to whom they can offer themselves as a seat. There is one caveat, however. On average, this effect lasts only 24 hours after contact with the animator after which the objects revert to their initial inanimate states. In 30 years of containment, no flamingos have come into contact with SCP-1507. So the Foundation's them? management believes that the flamingos came into contact with the animator much earlier, but its effect on them has for some reason proven much more long-lasting. But this is only a hypothesis, so the okay. investigation continues. But I think that the true reason for their animation is quite different. After all, as already managed, objects that come into contact with the animator show behavior to their intended purposes. Flamingos in nature neither display aggression toward one another nor toward other birds. Live flamingos rarely become hostile towards humans, unlike their plastic counterparts. I believe that the clues lie somewhere in the middle of the 20th century, when lawn plastic flamingos first began to appear. After artist Don Featherstone created the first lawn flamingos in 1957, these birds immediately became a symbol in popular culture and began popping up all over Florida and the Caribbean. Additionally, they became okay, participants then. in the large lawn cheer industry. Under cover of darkness, whole flocks of flamingos would appear on the lawns of a person who needed to be congratulated for something, be it a birthday or a housewarming party. The flamingos penetrated farther, farther into popular culture. When John Waters' film Pink Flamingos was released in 1972, these plastic birds finally became a symbol of kitsch and poor taste. Naturally, this angered many guardians of good taste and tradition, who had no desire to see such decorations in their city. Now let's move from history to my theories. I initially suspected that someone spent decades creating live plastic flamingos with aggressive tendencies, and that the creators had hoped to scare people off from installing tasteless decorations on their lawns, and thereby ruining the views of their cities. But as often happens, not everything went according to plan. The flamingos killed a man, thereby drawing the attention of the Foundation and stopping production. However, if my guess is correct, then why did this affect only flamingos and a single factory? 
After all, Coral Springs continues to produce various other tasteless plastic animals. Additionally, there are many similar factories that also manufacture lawn flamingos. It's likely that the creator of the anomalous flamingos was not an enemy of lawn kitsch, but rather Don Featherman himself. It's possible that Featherman was far from a typical artist and decorator. Three years before the creation of these birds, the United States ended its period of McCartyism, under which American citizens were persecuted for their suspected communist beliefs. This policy was ineffective, as it limited citizens' rights and freedoms. But the Cold War dragged on, and required effective means of dealing with the enemy. Pink became fashionable in the late 50s and early 60s, and the flamingo became the ideal spot, and was subsequently introduced to many homes in the U.S., especially in Florida. Them. The birds were supposed to track down and eliminate foreign agents. Before Alan Scott, there were dozens of perhaps hundreds of victims. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the need to identify communist agents disappeared. The secret services forgot about the flamingos until they killed their last victim, Alan Scott. Then they made the decision to take control of the birds. I'm certain the Foundation is aware of this situation, and even involved somehow. But the lower-ranked personnel with whom I spoke seemed to know nothing of the birds' origin, and to believe the 1991 incident to be a one-off. To confirm this, I analyzed all murders committed in the U.S. from 1957 until 1990. I was surprised by the number of victims sporting similar wounds, stab and cut wounds in the face, as well as the victims' connection to communist parties in Europe, Asia, or South America. Additionally, lawns near the homes of the victims in question were covered in pink flamingos. I hope that sooner or later I'll get to the bottom of the technology for animating these birds. Perhaps you can help me in this question. What do you think could have brought soulless plastic to life? I await your comments, and I'd be happy if you would like and subscribe to this channel. See you. Hey, everyone. So, that one was interesting as well. So they basically turn garnet ornaments into weapons for assassination. There's a reason I don't trust gnomes now. But anyways, that was a good video, I think, by Detective Void. And I can't wait to do another one. Please do not forget now to like and, to like and subscribe to Detective Void's videos, but also joining to mine as well. This is the Onset Mendo Raptor, signing out for the night.